You know, we've been fishing the Green River the last couple of days, Gary, and I've been watching these nymphs being drifted. Talk to me a little about behavioral drift. I know that's a big part of your book. It's, it's a big part of fishing, not just of, of, of the book or with caddisflies, but with mayflies, stoneflies. I wrote about behavioral drift first in Fly Fisherman magazine in my old Primer of Entomology column. That was, that was the first column I wrote. And it was significant. And everybody said, wow, you mean we could actually predict when the nymphs are going to be drifting? And you can't. What happens is that stoneflies and mayflies, basically, they'll drift at night. And the reason for behavioral drift is they just want to move to scatter to new areas. Caddisflies, especially case caddisflies, drift basically during the day. So if I'm going to be out on a river with a searching pattern, I'm going to put on a case caddis. That's what I'm going to use right up and through till dusk. Scientists have done studies, and they can tell when nymphs, larvae, when they drift. Stoneflies, mayflies, they drift basically at night. Look in the box of any fly fisherman, and what do you see? You see mayfly and stonefly imitations. I don't know about you, but I have a very hard time fishing a dead drift nymph at night. Now we're working on developing an indicator that has a little battery and it lights up when you get a strike. But until then, I would try to imitate an insect that drifts during the day. And that's the case caddis larva. The case caddis on the bottom of the stream, they'll break away, they'll drift with a flow, case and all. Very, very good searching pattern. And that's the pattern we're going to tie. It's very simple. Only a few materials. You have lead, a bit of fur, and some soft hackle fibers. Lead is optional. Some people like to put it on the leader. Some like to put it on the fly themselves. When I tie my lead in, I like to lay it along the bottom of the hook shank, wrap it a few times, and then just twist over it. For this basic pattern, I'm not going to put lead on it. If you do put lead, very, very important point, you lacquer it. Because if you don't, it'll discolor the entire fly. First part of the case caddis you imitate is the case. Use a soft tackle fiber. I have grouse here, but you can use any one you like. Strip away the fuzz and tie it in. You're going to pick out the longest stems that you can so that you don't have to do too many of them. Be careful to grip the stem exactly with your hackle pliers because it'll break otherwise. Make a few wraps around the shank. These don't have to be particularly tight and you're certainly not worried about neatness. And you wrap it up as far as it'll go. You tie it off. And then you repeat the procedure. Tie it in, run your thread up, snip the hackle butt, and wrap. Now this is not the way the finished fly is going to look, but for now, you simply wrap it and you leave it. You have control. You can pick light hackle, you could pick dark colored hackle. You could pick a model brown like a grouse. You can mix them. You can get this case to look any color you want. Which color do you use? Look at the naturals on the stream bottom. Some of them use stones that are very light colored. Others will use sticks that are very dark colored. Snip off the excess. Now later on, when the fly is finished, you're going to trim this.
Basically at this point I leave it untrimmed and then I finish up the trimming afterwards. This particular one, you pick up some caddisflies in the bottom and the nymphs and the larvae have very rough stick cases. And that's this one right here. If I wanted to pack this soft hackle very tight, I could trim it to any shape I wanted. Look on the stream bottom. You see the little four-sided cases of the granum caddis. You can imitate that exactly. You can trim it, you can make, an, make a four-sided case, and it looks very realistic. But you know what? That's not the important part of the fly. The case is an inanimate object. The fish don't notice it. I'll tell you something about trout. They don't look for negatives. That's why we can have a hook that is hanging down below the fly and the fish doesn't see it. He looks for positives, things that identify the insect as being alive. The positives for the case caddis larva and the most important segment of the tying is a little section of the body. Take your thread. I always like to use wax when I dub. You can use a little bit of fur. You can use some wool yarn. You can wrap a little bit of cotton chenille. You're making a little section of the body because here's what happens when the nymph breaks, breaks away. That nymph is on the bottom and either because for some natural reason he decided to drift downstream or else he's dislodged by accident and he's in the water column and he's flowing. And there's a point when he regains his equilibrium where he sticks his head out. Now the head is dark and the case is dark, but his body in between is a generally a lighter shade. Two colors, either a, a light yellow, can be very pale yellow, or else kind of a light green. This particular one, we're using a light green. When that insect is drifting and he sticks his head out and he looks around and he screams, where am I, where am I? It's that bit of color that alerts the trout that says, here is a live bit of drifting food. And you have to have that. Now I picked the roughest one I possibly could so I wouldn't have to get fancy on the trimming. And then to finish off this very simple fly, you can take your grouse hackle or if you want to use a different color, you can select a different soft hackle fiber. Strip off a few of the fibers. Tie them in under the throat. Get them situated, wrap your fly, you whip finish the fly off, and you have your finished pattern. I promised you that it would be rough and ugly, and I think I kept my promise. I'll trim off a few more offending hairs, but there's some fly tires who have a totally compulsive sense of neatness. They can't help but try to get this as perfect as possible. And you don't want to do that. The uglier and the rougher it is, the better it will catch fish. At, at this point, okay, slack it, let the line go, watch it. Go. There, stop, stop, okay. Oh, boy. The, oh, oh, tell me it's a brown, mama. Tell me. That was on the case caddis, Jack. Oh, does he have some palms to him.
he got in that current, he had so much weight behind him. I knew he was, you know, decent. Case Caddis, I was fishing at dead drift. You have a, you know, every time you, you fish a nymph, as far as I'm concerned, you have a, at least the way I fish it, you have a decision to make. And that's where do you want to put the lead? Do you want to put it on the leader or do you want to put it on the fly? Where do you put it? Right in the mouth of a big brown. Because when I fish a nymph, I fish it with a very short line method. I don't like to have 30 feet out. I fish a nymph with, with a 15 foot cast. Oh, Mama Louie. Pardon? What length the leader? This one, I wasn't fishing too deep. He was pretty much up shallow. It's full. I, th I think that, well, it's a hen, and I think she was on, a she, she was moving up to check out the spawning areas. And so I only needed about an eight or nine foot leader. Oh! There's something special about the evening, the close of a really great fishing adventure with a friend, the excitement of a large brown on a caddis. What a nightcap. The evenings and the caddis are synonymous. We always dream of finding that secluded little stream where only you and the trout are there. The fish are feeding and in the corner of your fly box lies a special fly, a caddis. One cast and a trophy of a lifetime rises for your fly. Gary, Mike, and I share with you in this dream and hope that our video helps you find it.